Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. This is Jason and we're looking at Irenaeus and his life, especially in relation to the four Gospels and the authorship. Now I have done a video before which was about 20 minutes uh, in length and it's a very scholarly video where uh, it looks at recent research in the Gospels um, concerning manuscript evidence. Uh, so if you find that video, it's a complementary video to this one. What we're looking at today is the work by R.W. Dale, which was written over 100 years ago, called The Living Christ and the Four Gospels, uh, page chapter 8. And we're looking at what he says concerning Irenaeus. And I'm going to read what he says and stop and just talk about it and then read a bit more, stop and talk about it. So let's go. Chapter 11, uh, chapter 8, Dale says, Under the reign of Marcus Aurelius, a philosopher among emperors, a saint among philosophers, the Christians suffered cruel persecution. The general policy of Rome was a policy of religious toleration. For to quote the famous sentence of Gibbon, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false and by the magistrate as equally useful. But from this toleration, the Christian faith, which maintained an incessant and open war against all the religions of the empire, was not unnaturally excluded. The hatred with which it was regarded was not only active, but it never ceased to exist. Under Marcus Aurelius, it became furious. He was one of the greatest and noblest princes and he accepted the imperial dignity with reluctance and cared nothing for the splendor of his great position. Could he have chosen for himself, he would have spent his years in meditation on the mystery and glory of human life, on the ideal of human nature. But the sentence of Plato was always on his lips, that the state, states would be great and prosperous if their philosophers were princes or if their princes were philosophers and he trusted that his own philosophical discipline had qualified him to render service to the immense populations which were under Roman power. The precepts which he set down for the conduct of his own life show that he saw the moral perils of his great position. Take care, he writes, that thou art not made into a Caesar, that thou art not dyed with the, this dye, for such things happen. Keep thyself then simple, good, pure, serious, free from affection, a friend of justice, a, way, a, way, a worshipper of the gods, kind, affectionate, strenuous in all proper acts. Strive to continue to be such as philosophy wished to make thee. Reverence the gods and help men. Short is life. There is only one fruit of this early life, a pious disposition and social acts. Do everything as a disciple of Antonius. Remember his constancy in every act which was comfortable to reason, conformable to reason, and his sweetness and his disregard for, of earthly fame, and his efforts to understand things, and how he bore with them that blamed him unjustly without blaming them in return, how he did nothing in a hurry, how he listened not, not to calumnies, and with how little he was satisfied, such as lodging, bed, dress, food, servants, and how laborious he was and patient, and how he tolerated freedom of speech in those who opposed his opinion, and the pleasure that he had when any man showed him anything better, and how religious he was without superstition. Imitate all this, that thou mayst have a good a conscience when thy last hour comes, as he had. End of quote. His meditations, which are were written during his campaign on the Danube, sometimes touched the very confines of the morality illustrated in the Sermon on the Mount. Surely his vision of an ideal goodness was revealed to him by the light from God. His personal character was not unworthy of his precepts. He was laborious, courageous, upright, kindly, magnanimous, and yet he persecuted the Christians. <coughs> To what extent he was personally responsible for the severities inflicted upon them has been disputed. 
During his reign, the empire suffered grave calamities and was menaced with still graver dangers. <coughs> the public mind was agitated and alarmed. What were the causes of the earthquakes, pestilence, famine, which filled the Roman world with distress? By what invisible and hostile powers had the barbarians on the frontiers been excited to revolt? Was it possible that the gods were angry because the Christians had forsaken their temples and were speaking of the ancient worship with fierce contempt? Popular terror may have demanded that the adherents of the new superstition should be sacrificed as a propitiation to the offended deities, and the emperor may, be, may have believed that it would be imprudent, perhaps impossible, to interfere for their protection. The Christians had suffered under Antonius, whom he venerated an example of philosophic virtue, and as the Christians were charged not only with atheism, but with committing in secret the most horrible crimes, he may have thought that they deserved to die. It is probable that he regarded with apprehension the political effects of this strange superstition. Common worship was one of the strongest securities of the university unity of the state. There was disloyalty to the empire in the refusal to take part in the public religious ceremonies. Whatever may be the explanation of his policy during the whole course of his reign, to quote the characteristic words of Gibbon, Marcus despised the Christian as a philosopher and punished them as a sovereign. The persecution in southern Gaul in AD 177 seems to have begun in tumultuous outbreak of popular passion. The general hatred with which the Christians were regarded had for some unknown reason become so fierce that their presence was not tolerated in the baths, the markets or the public streets. When they appeared, they were violently and brutally attacked. They were stoned and robbed. To bring the disorder to an end, the local authorities intervened and gave orders that the Christian should be imprisoned and that on the arrival of the governor of the province, they should be put on their trial. A letter from the servants of Christ dwelling in Lyons and Vienne in Gaul to their brethren in Asia and Phyriga tells the story of the sufferings which the martyrs endured, first from the fury of the mob and afterwards from the severities of the law. Nearly all the more zealous members of the two churches were seized. To subdue their courage, they were subjected to intolerable tortures. They were cruelly scourged. Some were compelled to sit on chairs and burning iron. Many died from the horrible treatment inflicted on them in prison. There were some whose constancy gave way under this persistent torment, but most of them showed a glorious fidelity. Those who declared their Roman citizenship were beheaded. The rest were flung to the wild beasts at the public games. Among the martyrs that died in prison was Pothius, Bishop of Lyons. He was more than 90 years old and was very infirm, partly from his great age, partly from disease. As he was being dragged away from the public tribunal, the crowd through which he passed struck him and kicked him, showing no reverence to his age. Those who could not reach him flung at him whatever they had in their hands to avenge the injuries which he had done to their gods. The old man's strength was exhausted, and in two days he died. Irenaeus, a presbytery, a presbyter in the church of Lyons, was elected his successor. Just to note here that, that there is this systematic persecution going on, that the bishop of his own city had been killed, and yet Irenaeus was elected to be a bishop and was willing to stand in the gap even when the church had been persecuted. He was willing to make a stand for truth. He wouldn't back down against his persecutors. Um, about Irenaeus, he was a, a native of Asia Minor and in his youth lived in Smyrina and had known Polycarp. Between the churches of Asia Minor and the churches in southern Gaul, the relations were very intimate. It was from Asia Minor, in all probability, that Lyons and Vyahin 
V-I-E-N-N-E, -E, had received the Christian gospel. And the churches in Asia Minor would listen to the story of the courage and fidelity of the Christian martyrs in these two cities with the same kind of interest and gratitude and enthusiasm with which the Congregational Churches of England 30 or 40 years ago listened to the story of the courage and fidelity of the Christian martyrs of Madagascar who had first heard of the grace of the glory of Christ from the lips of Congregational ministries, missionaries. Even as a presbyter of the church, Irenaeus must have been a man of some distinction. In the early days of the persecution, his brethren who were suffering for their own faith sent him to Rome to appeal to the sympathy of El Eleutherus, at that time Bishop of Rome, on behalf of the Montanists who were suffering persecution in Asia Minor and Phrygia. When Irenaeus became bishop after the martyrdom of Pothinus, he showed great vigour. He was zealous for the conversion of the heathen. He was a resolute assailant of heresy, and he took an active part in the more important ecclesiastical affairs of his time. Affairs of his time. Um, I'm just going to get uh, a cup of tea, uh, a, a drink of water. I'll just be two seconds. Hi there folks, we're back online, hope everybody's okay, just got a big yogurt in front of me. I love reading these old books. I love them. So, I have my cup of water. <coughs> hmm. When I've done this, I'm going helping an elderly lady to move a fridge and, and put a hole, block up a hole and now the lady's got um, a, I'm just eating my yoghurt now the lady has got uh, a hole in her house where a mouse keeps coming so I'm going to uh, pull the fridge out and put block up the hole uh, later on. 
So I'm just eating here. If you're wondering what I'm eating, it's well, it's not a yogurt really, it's a blancmange. It's chocolate blancmange with mint cream on top. And I could eat this all day. So, so how's your day been? You had a good day? Good. Here we are. Mm -mm. Let's get back to some scholarship now. Mm -mm. RNA and scholarship. The reason why I'm reading this old book is I will put relevant scholarship and modern scholarship online with this. Okay. And just to note, for those who are interested, if you're doing scholarship on the early church fathers, for example, on Irenaeus, I mean, there are, on Irenaeus, there are a number of key works that have been written on him. And if you're going to be a scholar just in Irenaeus scholarship, you'd have to read a lot. Okay. So we're just like scratching the surface a little bit here. All right.
Hi folks, well, we're back on the second part of Aranaeus. Uh, the computer just went down and I'm eating again. And um, hope everybody's okay. So let's get back to Aranaeus. Excuse me. <coughs> Page one four two of uh, the Living Christ and Four Gospels, R. W. Dale. He writes about Irenaeus. His great work was a controversial treatise against Gnosticism, which was written in the early years of his. Episcopit, probably between AD 180 to AD 185. It is usually quoted on the short title Against Heresies. He uses the books of the New Testament as freely as any modern theologian and with the same reverence for their authority. One of his testimonies to the four Gospels I must give at length, he says, quote, Irenaeus, so firm a ground on which these Gospels rest that they, that the very heretics themselves bear witness to them and starting from the documents each one of them endeavors to establish his own peculiar doctrine from the ebonites who used matthew's gospel only are confuted out of this very name making false suppositions with regard to the lord but marcion mutilating that according to luke is proved to be a blasphemer of the only existing god from those passages which he still retains those again who separate jesus from christ alleging that christ remain impassable but that it was Jesus who suffered, prefer the Gospel of Mark, if they read it with the love of truth, may have their errors rectified. Those, moreover, who follow Valentius, making copious use of that according to John, shall be proved to be totally in error by means of this Gospel. Since then our opponents do bear witness to us and make use of these documents, our proof derived from them is firm and true. It is not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. And since there are four zones of the world in which we live and four principal winds while the church is scattered throughout all the world and the pillar and ground of the church is the Gospel and the Spirit of Life, it is fitting that she should have four pillars breathing out immorality on every side, immortality in every side and vivifying men afresh from which fact it is evident that the word, the artificer of all, he that sitteth upon the cherubim and contain all things, he who was manifest to them, men, has given us the gospel under four aspects, but bound together by one spirit. As also David says, when entreating his manifestations, that thou sittest between the cherubim, shine forth. For the cherubim too were forced, and their faces were images of the dispensation of the Son of God. The testimony of the four Gospels in this passage and in other parts of the writings of Irenaeus is something very much more than the expression of the private opinion of a single Christian writer. He is expressing what he assumed to be the general judgment of those Christian churches which claim to inherit the apostolic faith. One heretical sect might appeal in support of its heresies to the Gospel of Matthew, another to the Gospel of Mark, another to the Gospel of Luke, another to the Gospel of John. One of the sects might mutilate, mutilate one gospel and another, and the churches which were faithful to the apostolic tradition I acknowledge the authority of all four and have preserved them unmutilated. Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyons and he had the right to speak of the churches of Southern Gaul. He had recently sent, been sent on an important mission to Rome and he must have known whether or not the Roman church regarded all the four gospels with reverence and believed that they were written uh, by men whose names they bear. He was born in Asia Minor and there were intimate relations between the churches of Asia Minor and the churches of Gaul. He had a right to speak from Asia Minor and his testimony is the testimony of the church of Asia Minor, Rome and Southern Gaul. In the year AD 185 all these churches 
held that the four Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This indeed is not disputed. I think critics don't realise the power of that of the of the two arguments being used here. Powerful, powerful arguments are being interplayed by Irenaeus, and these arguments still stand today, even in modern scholarship. The first argument is the very fact that the Gnostic Gospels are quoting the four Gospels, which gives shows that the four Gospels are authoritative. The second grand fact is that this uh, acceptance of the four Gospels is from various sides of the Roman Empire from the north to the south to the east to the west, which gives it a powerful argument and can't be undermined very easily. We go on. It's been alleged that the fanciful arguments by which Irenaeus attempted to prove that there must be four Gospels and that there cannot be more than four deprived his testimony of all value. What weight, it has been asked, can be attached to a man's critical judgment who contends that because there are four zones of the world because there are four principal winds the north the south the east and the west because there are four cherubim there must be four authoritative narratives of the life of our lord and no more <laughs> the question has nothing to do with the critical judgment of Irenaeus. the worth of his testimony does not rest upon his personal competence to determine whether the four gospels were written by matthew mark luke and john but upon the opportunities with which he had for knowing that this was the general belief of the church in his time and had been the general belief of the church as long as he could remember. He was an able man and learned man, but like other able and learned men of those days, he found parables and mystery symbols where we find none. His logic, though often solid, is sometimes fanciful. But the mystical reasons which he alleged for there being four gospels and only four, instead of lessening the forces of his testimony, add immense immensely to its strength religious veneration such as that which he regarded these books is of slow growth they must have held a great place in the church as far back as the memory of living men extended they must have been transmitted to him and his contemporaries as a sacred treasure by the preceding generation further Irenaeus as I have said came from Asia Minor and it was in Asia Minor that the Apostle John died about AD 100 and spent his last years in AD 185, there must have been men still living in Smyrna and in Ephesus who had known immediately some of John's personal disciples and friends. Indeed, Irenaeus himself in his early youth had listened to the teaching of Polycarp, and Polycarp had intercourse with John and with others who had seen the Lord. There are several references to Polycarp and the great work of Irenaeus on the heresies, but the most interesting in him Instructive reference to him is in the remonstrance which he addressed to Florinus, who was one of his early friends, but had lapsed into heresy. After saying that the present opinions of Florinus, Florinus were not those which had been handed down to him by the elders before us who were disciples of the apostles, Irenaeus proceeds. For I saw thee when I was still a boy in Lower Asia in company with Polycarp, while thou was faring prosperously in the royal court and endeavouring to stand well with him, for I distinctly remember the incidents of that time better than the events of recent occurrences, for the lessons received in childhood growth, with the growth of the soul became identified with it, so that I can describe the very place, says Irenaeus, in which the blessed Polycarp used to sit when he discoursed, and his goings out and his coming in, and his manner of life and his personal appearance, at the discourses which he held before the people and how he would describe his intercourse with john and with the rest who had seen the lord and how he would <coughs> excuse me how he would relate their words <coughs> excuse me and whatsoever he had heard from them about the lord and about his miracles and about his teaching polycarp as having received them from eyewitnesses of the life of the word would relate together in accordance with the scriptures to these discourses I used to listen at the time with said attention by God's mercy which was bestowed upon me, noting them down on paper, but in my heart and by the grace of God I constantly renuminate upon them faithfully. We can imagine Irenaeus Presbyter, Bishop of Lyons, walking slowly in deep meditation on the banks of Rhodes, says W. Dale. 
and thinking of his early years when he listened to Polycarp in Smyrina, the face and form and the voice of the saintly man who had died a martyr for Christ's sake came back to him. He could recall the reverence with reverence with which he had heard him speak of the disciple whom Jesus loved, and of other friends whom the Lord he had known, the miracles of Christ with Poly which Polycarp had heard John describe, the discourses of Christ which Polycarp had heard John repeat, Polycarp's recollections of John's expositions of our Lord's words, Polycarp's accounts of what had been told him by the other men who had been friends of Christ during his earthly history. All these were to Irenaeus most precious and an imperishable possession. Those were his student days. It was then that he was prepared for his work as presbytery and bishop. What he had heard from Polycarp was a sacred trust. He was under solemn obligation to be faithful to it. It is probable, is it probable, is it possible that Irenaeus would have acknowledged the genuineness and authority of the gospel said to have been written by John if he had never heard Polycarp speak of it? It is certain that when he heard Polycarp, John had been dead for many years. If at time Polycarp, John's disciples, had known nothing of anything of the gospel that, sorry, it is certain that when he heard Polycarp, John had been dead for many years. If at the t that time Polycarp, John's disciple, had known nothing of any gospel that John had wit written, had ever spoken of it, I cannot believe that Irenaeus would ever have been induced to receive the fourth gospel as having been written by Polycarp's master and friend. Irenaeus had received traditions concerning our Lord from other elders who had known <coughs> the original apostles. He had also received traditions from some who had been friends of men who had known the original apostles. These traditions are indeed not always trustworthy. Some of the elders whom Irenaeus knew for who, of who or, or from whom he quoted may, may have misunderstood what they heard from an apostle or from a friend of an apostle, or may in later years have confused what they heard with with their own inferences from it. <coughs> Excuse me. Even Polycarp's recollection of the precise words which he had heard from John might not always have been perfectly accurate. He might have mistaken their meaning when he first heard them. But the lapse of years and phrases and sentences lodged in his memory might have been molded into new forms by the ebb and flow of his own thoughts as stones lying on the beach are rounded and polished by the ebb and flow of the tide. Traditions of what the apostles said, even when they are reported by men who were the immediate disciples of the apostles, cannot commend an unqualified confidence. They require collateral support, still less than they command an unqualified confidence when they are reported by men who did not themselves <coughs> hear the apostles, although the tradition may have come to them from men whose intercourse with the apostles have been intimate and extended over many years. But if the question at issue is whether a gospel bearing the name of John contains an account of our Lord identical in substance with that which John was accustomed to give to his disciples, then the evidence of the disciples of John and of the disciples is of great and irresistible strength. If they accept the gospel, if they offer no protest against its genuineness, I, for my part, am compelled to believe that he wrote it. And this is the real question at issue. From those who contest the Jonine authorship of the four gospel, assert that it contains an account of our Lord wholly different from that which John would have given had he written a gospel at all, that its conception of Jesus of Nazareth as the eternal word who had become flesh to reveal the Father to save the world is rooted in philosophical speculations on the nature and being God, of God, wholly alien from the thought of fishermen of Galilee, was who was an unlearned man that his spiritual freedom is inconsistent with the religious position of John, who was an apostle of the circumcision, and who it is maintained regarded Paul's revolt against Judaism with stern hostility, that what are described as the simple ethical discourses concerned, contained in the first three Gospels represent the real character of our Lord's teaching, and therefore none of his original apostles could have attributed to him the mystical and dogmatic discourses contained in the fourth. In other words, it is contended not only that John did not write the gospel which bears his name, but that he could not have written it, since it contains a theory of our Lord's person, 
an account of our Lord's teaching such as John himself could never have given to his disciples. The contention is an impossible one. If the representation of our Lord of our Lord's teaching in the fourth gospel had been wholly different from that which John had given during his lifetime, neither John's friend nor disciples of John's friend would have allowed it to have been accepted as genuine. Suppose that Dr. Pusey had, had never published any books or tracts or sermons during his life, but had taught his characteristic doctrine concerning the church, the priesthood and the sacraments to receive generation to generation of Oxford students. <laughs> <coughs> he died in 1882. Suppose that early in the next century, 20 years after his death, or even 30 or 40, a treatise were to appear bearing his name, which assailed with elaborate argument the whole theory of episcopacy, and maintained that every separate congregation of devout men and women is, according to the idea of Christ, a true church under Christ's immediate government, and with powers derived from Christ's presence to appoint its own ministers and to exercise discipline. Suppose that this treatise attributed to Dr. Pusey contained a vigorous attack on the doctrine of baptismal regeneration and the real presence in the Eucharist and defended the Zwinglian theory of the sacraments. Is it credible, while men were still living who had been Dr. Pusey's students at Oxford, this treatise would be received as genuine? Is it credible that it would be received as genuine while men were still living who had derived their ecclesiastical and sacramental beliefs from Dr. Pusey's students? Would there be no protest, no controversy? I think that's a very powerful argument. It's a very powerful argument. And you often see in debates today, for example, uh, Bart Ehrman debates, where he will often use the argument that the synoptic gospels are not the same as John's gospel, that the John's gospel, the Jesus of John's gospel is not the same as the Jesus in the synoptics. But the argument that Dr. Dale is using here is a very powerful argument. That means that uh the disciples of the lord the apostles um what you're saying is that they allowed a complete different view of jesus to come about and they allowed it to go unchallenged and that's just indefensible and it's it's just not according to facts they they believed before that the, the gospel of john was correct because they felt it was representative of the real jesus very interesting but the theory which denies that john could have written the fourth gospel says dale requires us to believe something quite in for according to this theory the doctrinal teaching of the fourth gospel is irreconcilable with what is alleged the doctrinal teaching of John must have been as the ecclesiastical and sacramental teaching of the imaginary treatise published after Dr. Pusey's death with Dr. Pusey's ecclesiastical and sacramental teaching during his lifetime. And yet there is no trace of any protest against the Jonine authorship of the full gospel. <coughs> On the part of the men who had known John for many years and who had loved reverenced him, and it is certain that scholars and bishops who were the friends of John's friends and had received from them the tradition of his sanctity and of his teaching believed that the four gospel maintained an authentic account of our Lord's ministry and that John wrote it. For me, this is at least is absolutely certain that the representation of our Lord and of his teaching given in the four gospel is identical in substance with that which the church's major had heard from John's own lips. Now, it's interesting to know, uh, just to uh, finish now on, on Irenaeus, my, my last bit of uh, food. It's interesting to know that this was book was written in, let's see, at least 1890 or a bit before that. Dale is expressing his belief in the authenticity of the Gospel of John, which implies that he believes it's a first century document and attested by Irenaeus, who also remembers the days of Polycarp, who attests to the authenticity, authenticity of the Gospel of John. Now, at the time of writing, 
R.W. Dale, and right up into the mid-1950s, there was a general belief that the Gospel of John was a late document. It was not first century document. Until a writer called um, Robinson, who wrote Honest to God, he was a, a bishop but a skeptic, which is a, quite, quite comical, really, being a skeptic and yet a bishop. But he actually wrote a, a defense of an earlier, excuse me, an earlier date for the Gospel of John. Since that book that Robinson wrote, there has been documentary evidence. For example, there is a parchment in uh, Manchester Ryland's library. Uh, which dates the Gospel of John, which is dated to around about 120 or maybe earlier, which means if that is the case, that the Gospel of John is, is uh, to be dated as a first century document. So after uh, over a hundred years of scholarly research since Dale, Dale's argument really, I think, has been confirmed by the manuscript evidence which I find interesting anyhow I really enjoy these historical soirees I really enjoy reading these old books I it and um, I, I thoroughly enjoy reading these old papers and old articles and thinking about them I think one or two things that I will mention about Irenaeus uh, before I finish <coughs> that is first of all First of all, on the fallibility of Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus was fallible. He believed that the Lord Jesus was 50 years old. And so there's an example of fallibility. Now, here's the point. You might say, well, if he can get how old Jesus is wrong, then why should we believe him about what he's saying about the Gospels? Well, quite simple. And I think uh, R.W. Dale touched upon it. Quite simple, I think two reasons number one um when you're looking at historical data you're never going to get anything everything perfect and uh, Irenaeus was not perfect he was he was a man who made mistakes number two um i think that when you look at the evidence objectively I think Irenaeus is a good, was qualified to testify to the wide use of the Gospels. And we can investigate whether he was correct in his assertion when he says that the Gnostic Gospels quoted the four Gospels. And as we check that out, we find that he's a credible witness. And uh, so, yes, he's fallible, but also at the same time, he was a credible witness. And modern scholarship has spent a lot of time trying to undermine Irenaeus. But Irenaeus is a very important person in, in the history and development of uh, Christian theology, and especially concerning the canon. I think secondly, I'd like to sp talk about, just for a minute, the great intellect of Irenaeus. And also, I think, the great courage of Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus was unquestionably a courageous man. There, he left uh, as a catechumist, a catechist who, who just taught the catechist. He was not a bishop. He went to Rome to, to talk to the, to the, um, the bishop of Rome uh, to help with the, to try and intercede for those who were possibly being persecuted in Lyons. And he, he, while he was doing that, the city was sacked. The Christians were attacked by Roman soldiers. Why? Because the Gnostics had said that the Christians were killing babies. So the Roman soldiers go into the city. It's all, it, it is a garrison, a very important garrison city, by the way, for the Roman Empire. Just, just thought I'd put that in. Very important city. So the Roman soldiers are already there, but they go in there now specifically to kill out the Christians. And what do they do? They put Christians on hot iron chairs. They 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 torture young young men uh, who were boys. 
to try and renounce their faith in front of their parents and they massacre the Christians they they kill the Christians and then they kill them so much that they won't even let Christians bury their families instead they throw the flesh to the dogs or they burn the flesh and then scatter the ashes that's how utterly devastating the persecution was concerning the Christians in Lyons or in or uh, look Dunham in Gaul so when Irenaeus comes back the bishop has been killed the Christians have been desecrated and massacred and destroyed so what would you do you would want to flee you would want to leave not Irenaeus no 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 what does he do they elect him to be bishop and he stands tall and he teaches the people of God in the midst of violent persecution. He stands for the Lord. He stands for the people of God. What a warrior for God. And then secondly, coming back to the second first point, which is which I'm dealing with secondly, because I dealt with the second point as a first point. I know it's a bit confusing. But anyhow, secondly. Irenaeus was a theological genius. If you get time, read Against the Heresies. It is a very difficult book to read. It is very intricate in its analysis of Gnosticism. But if you're going to be able to, to even begin to engage on the origin of the canon, on whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead, whether the New Testament is authentic or not. You need to have at least understood the Gnostics and Irenaeus was a master in understanding the Gnostics. He put his whole heart and mind into studying their systems. So when he's expanding them, he's expanding them in a wonderful scholarly way. And I say along with shed one of the great presbyterian theologians in america i say along with shed that Irenaeus was a theological genius per excellent and you cannot help but when you read against his heresies that you are coming across a great mind and a great theologian so i'd encourage you to read it read it and digest it look at how he understands this system look at how he what the system believes and why the system believes what it believes because gnosticism was a multiple system of various schools of thought and Irenaeus was able to expound it and critic critique it in a brilliant and wonderful way one of the areas that Irenaeus defeated Gnosticism and also how you can defeat anybody in a debate against Christianity is to do what a, what one could describe as a meta-narrative apologetic what does that mean well when Irenaeus was up against the Gnostic the Gnostics had their various ideas about the nature of reality the nature of creation the nature of evil, the nature of Christ, and all the rest of it. What Irenaeus did is he gave the full story of the creation, fall, redemption of Jesus Christ. And it was that full meta narrative story as a whole that he used to critique and demolish Gnosticism. And when you're up against an atheist, a Muslim, or anybody else in debate, use that method. Use the re creation, the fall, redemption, meta narrative as a whole as your methodology to critique your opponent and to stay defensive. Because what the critic will do, whether there be a academic who is criticizing the Bible, whether it be an atheist on the streets or wherever in your college or university, and they attack the Bible, what they do is they will go to some minutiae point within the text of the Bible or against Christianity, some minutiae point where they will try to find some kind of contradiction within your system in that way. But if you present to them the whole overarching scheme of the Christian faith presented in the Bible, the creation, the fall, 
and the redemption uh, through Jesus Christ and you present it as a totality then it kind of it kind of offshoot it, it kind of I can only describe it as outmaneuvers the opponent because whatever contradiction they bring whatever problem they bring you outmaneuver it with the meta narrative now if the skeptic gets clever and tries to meet you on your ground with a meta narrative themselves then let them bring it on because your meta narrative is more consistent than their meta narrative but whenever someone comes against you and quotes you specifics to try to undermine your position as a Christian, go to the meta narrative, go to the grand story of the creation, the, the fall and redemption in Christ. And uh, you'll be OK. All right. And that's what Irenaeus did. He used the meta narrative of the Christian faith to debunk, destroy and demolish agnostic, uh, uh, the Gnosticism. In his day but he was a great thinker and a great a great mind and uh, awesome okay I'm gonna go and uh, that's it for today uh, there will be Google Hangouts in the week debates discussions uh, there'll be lectures there'll be sermons there'll be lots of things happening individual interviews with people oh it's gonna happen big time coming in the next few weeks God bless you enjoy your day and uh, this is Jay Bo signing off god bless you i hope you enjoyed the soiree with Irenaeus. love the guy love the early church fathers god bless you and have a lovely day